world because of sinful desire. Let me encourage you to go ahead and leave your Bibles open to that passage. That will be our main text this morning. Once again, we do have those who are visiting with us. We're thankful that you're here to worship and to praise our God together with us today. And now we're going to spend a little bit of time in study of the Word of God, and hopefully touching on some things that all of us can benefit from. I want to start off with a question this morning. Maybe it's a question you've given some thought to. How could you be a better Christian? Think about that for just a moment. How could you be a better Christian? Some answers that you might give, well, if I prayed more. I think many of us reflect on that from time to time. We recognize our reliance on God. We recognize how we can communicate with Him, bringing our hearts to Him. And we realize that I need to be more prayerful. Maybe you would say, if I studied more, certainly that would be a a uh, well-deserving answer. If all Scripture is by inspiration, and if all Scripture has the aim of ultimately making us complete, then yes, we, we should study more. We should look more to the Word of God so that we can be a better Christian. Maybe you say, if I gave more. We read about the idea of charity and and being a giving person, a a providing for those who are in need, a providing for the household of faith, a providing for our neighbor. And so we might say, I am blessed. And so if I gave more, I would be a better Christian. I'd be more closely following the example even of God himself. And certainly you say, well, maybe if I sinned less. All of us, as we look at our lives and we look at the the things that may be wrong and the areas in which we're seeking to grow and say, if I could eliminate lust and eliminate sin in these areas, then I would certainly be a better follower of God and be a better Christian. All those answers are right. All those answers are good. But of course, there's a flaw even in in the question itself. We begin to think of the the checklist and the do's and the don'ts, and if I just did X, Y, and Z, then I'll have arrived. I'll be what I'm supposed to be. And even in thinking that way, we may be missing the mark. This morning, and and for a few Sundays in the coming months, we're going to be looking at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter, to our knowledge, is Peter's final epistle. In fact, he even makes mention of the fact that He expects his departure from this world to come very quickly. He says in verses 13 and 14 of the first chapter, he says, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. We know even as was read from chapter 1 and verse 1, Peter is writing to those of an equal faith, he says. The same kind of faith. And that in itself is maybe fairly astounding. If he is writing to the same churches that he addresses the first epistle to, he's writing to churches that were predominantly Gentile. Peter as a Jew, but yet he is writing to those who he understands they have the same kind of faith as I have. And this is by the righteousness of of God. And his aim is to remind them, to give them instruction, to remind them of truth. And why is that so important? Well, if you would read all of 2 Peter, and beginning in chapter 2, Peter talks about how there have always been false prophets and false teachers, and now those same kinds of false prophets and teachers are going to come among you. And so Peter says, while I'm here, I am going to remind you of truth. I'm going to remind you of the ways of God and the teachings of God. And all that has one purpose. Because if Peter were to answer this question, and as he does even in the verses that we read, I'd be a better Christian if I were like God. Notice again, the passage, beginning in verse uh, 3, or rather verse 2. 
Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. What is the aim of all this instruction? What is the aim of reminding them of truth? What is the aim of God's promises to them? That they would become more like God. That they would become partakers of the divine nature itself. We are not called to simply do some things. We are not called to simply avoid some things. We are called by God to become like Him. We want to introduce that idea this morning and then set up some things that we will talk about in some coming lessons. But let's even just begin with this idea and this notion that really this is what Scripture is about. Because you start in the very beginning as God created man, and so many of you are already familiar with exactly what the text says, that when God made man, God made man in His image. And we can read more about that in the second chapter of Genesis, how God even breathed spirit and life into man. Now what does that mean? What does it mean that we were created in the very image of God? Well, that's a moral designation. That man, as he was originally made, is in the image of God in a holy sense. God who is love, God who is truth, God who is faithful, God who is all these things, these moral components. That is how God made man. Man is in his image. That is how man should be. That is his original state and how he should be. But of course, what does the scripture also say? Well, sin entered the picture. And so we read how sin entered the picture in Genesis chapter 3. As Eve and then Adam transgressed the commandment of God. And so right then and there we see how a change takes place. And now man who had once walked in the very presence of God, a holy God, and now man is afraid. And man is ashamed. And man is is cast out from the garden and away from the presence of God. And as Paul defines it in Romans chapter 3 and in verse 23, that all have sinned. And what is the consequence of sin? We fall short of the glory of God. Think about that. That's the real consequence of sin. We're no longer like God. And when we think even of how the Scripture talks about sin, it helps us to understand why some things that within our culture, and maybe within our own minds that we would say, are nowhere near the level of other things, yet God defines them as sinful. So for instance, why would God stick lying in the same category as murderers and adulterers and other things? Well, what is the result when I lie? I am not being like God. God who is truthful. God who has never told a lie. And so by my actions, I am no longer like Him. I am falling short of His glory. I am falling short of how God made me and what God purposed for me. That is the problem with sin. Don't let that fact escape you. We are not talking about how God one day wrote a rule book and then just started looking at us and saying, I really want you to follow these things and I'm going to be really disappointed in you when you don't do these things. No, that's not it at all. God revealed who He is in the Word of God. And He defines for us, here is how we are to be like Him. When we sin, we fall short of that glory. That is why we are to repent of those things. We are to change our ways because we are no longer being what God purposed for us. And so the rest of Scripture is about how God wants us to return 
and be like him again. That's his purpose of Israel, even in the Old Testament. We talk about Israel and we talk about how they're given a law. And so maybe we even get this idea that within the law, okay, is they, they do enough things, they avoid enough things, and then they're going to be fine. What's the purpose of law? God said to Israel in the Old Testament, Therefore you shall be holy as I am holy. The purpose of that law was to help Israel be like their God, to be like their Father. Now Israel, they did not achieve that. They would not follow God. They would not follow Him in faith. And so even within the Old Testament Scripture, God then looks forward to a time when this renewal, this restoration, this recreation in the image of God would be possible. Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, Ezekiel, a prophet of God to his people who had been taken away into captivity, being punished for their sins, being punished for the consequence of their failure to follow in the steps of God. But God says to the prophet Ezekiel that the day was coming, in verse 25, I'll sprinkle clean water on you, and you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. God says the day is coming when I'm going to purify this people. I'm going to cleanse them with water, and I'm going to renew them with my spirit. This is recreation. And this is even what our Lord has in mind in John chapter 3. When he is speaking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus understands that truly Jesus has come from God, he must have come from God. No one can do these things, these signs, unless he comes from God. And yet Jesus, who knows the thoughts and hearts of all men, says to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you'll not enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is questioned. He's, He's confused by this. How can a man be born again? How can he enter into his mother's womb a second time? What does Jesus say? Unless you are born of water and spirit. It's exactly what Ezekiel was talking about in Ezekiel 36. I'm going to cleanse my people with water, and I'm going to put my spirit within them. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 3. Here is what God was purposing. Here is what God was bringing about. He was going to renew His people. He was going to make them in His image once again. And that is exactly what happens in Christ. In Christ, we can be like Him. We're going to talk about our role in this, but first, before we do that, we have to acknowledge this is only happening because of God and because of what Christ has done. Paul, in speaking to the saints in Corinth and reminding them of their past ways and how they themselves have been engaged in so many sins, reminds them in 1 Corinthians 6 and in verse 11 that you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified. All this came about because of what Christ did. We can become what God intended for us to be only because of what Christ has done. He who has washed us from our sins, He who has now sanctified us, made us holy, He who has justified us, put us in the right with God. All this comes by Him. But, we'd be remiss if we ignored the fact that our Lord, who came to wash us, to sanctify us, to justify us, also says we are to follow Him. We are to obey Him. And even in the Great Commission, when Jesus said to His followers in Matthew 28 that all authority has been given to me, And they need to go and make disciples of all the nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you need to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Well, what's the purpose of that? 
What's the purpose of Jesus saying to his, his followers, to his disciples, you go and you teach and you tell people to follow and obey me the exact same thing we've been talking about. We can be like God. That's the purpose of His will. That's the purpose of His law, if you will. It's the purpose of His commandments. So we can be like Him. Previously in the Sermon on the Mount, the conclusion of Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus had gone through the various aspects of righteousness and how they had heard that righteousness was this. But I am telling you, here's what real righteousness is. And so in matters of anger, in matters of lust, in matters of marriage and divorce, in matters of how we treat our enemies, Jesus is saying, here's what real righteousness is. And at the conclusion of all that, He says, therefore you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Apostle Paul will come to this idea several times. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, that we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Again, in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, in verses 23 and 24, that we are to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. This idea permeates the New Testament. And it's why in so many of these epistles, as the apostles are reminding the brethren, here is what it means to follow God. Here is how you follow God. Well, this is the aim. Being perfect as our Father is perfect. Being transformed from glory to glory. Putting on the new self, or in the words of Peter, becoming partakers of the divine nature. Becoming again what God originally made. People in His image. Well, how do we become like Him? Well, an aspect that's not found in Second Peter, because Peter is already addressing those of like precious faith, of course, is the new birth. Here in a, in a few moments, we'll give an invitation Earlier, when I was mentioning John 3 and verse 5, and Jesus saying, those who are born of the water and the Spirit, Donis had his hand raised in the, in the back row. Because he experienced that last week. A brother brought into Christ. Well, a new birth occurs. And the only way any of us will ever become like God is we have to be recreated. We have to be born again. And so when that time comes, if you find yourself in need, you've not yet obeyed the gospel of God, you've not yet found the real life that God wants you to have, the new birth, then we would love nothing more than to help you in that. To help you in your faith have the forgiveness of your sins be brought in to the family of God being born again. But turning our attention now to 2 Peter, Here's where Peter says where we're going to become like him. And it's knowledge. Even within the text we've already looked at, you'll note both in verses 2 and 3, the idea of knowledge is prevalent. So he says in verse 2, grace and peace, which by the way is, is somewhat of a standard greeting, you might say, in, in New Testament epistles, but those words are not used flippantly. They're very serious. Grace and peace that come from God. Peter saying, I want you to have these. Well, how is it we're going to have grace and peace? Peter says, grace and peace will be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Then again in verse 3, it says, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Okay, again, grace and peace are multiplied to us in the knowledge of God, now Peter is saying, God has granted to us everything we need for this, but where is it found? Through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. Peter says, all this is coming by knowledge. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, we don't necessarily make a lot about word studies, and I'm not really going to this morning either. But there is something significant going on in the text here. 
Peter will talk about knowledge a good bit. It may very well be because of the false teachers who were going around that time. They were claiming gnosis. They were claiming knowledge. Well, Peter says there's a knowledge greater than that. Peter uses the term epinosis. Now, he will use the term gnosis later on in verse 6 when we look at these eight attributes, that qualities that we'll talk about in later lessons. We're supposed to add knowledge to our virtue. That's gnosis, understanding. But in verse 2, in verse 3, and then again in verse 8, he uses this term epinosis, a full, complete knowledge. And what do we mean by that? Well, in the context of 2 Peter, here's how I kind of picture it. This week, some of you are going to the doctor. I don't know who, I just know in an audience like this, some of you are going to the doctor this week. Now, your doctor may have been in practice many years, but even if he was fresh out of medical school, you would still hope that his knowledge was not simply limited to what he read. You would hope that within the process of his education, he had done rounds with other doctors. He had shadowed. He had observed. He he had been through an internship where he is learning and not simply reading to come to an understanding in his mind, but he is putting these things into practice so that when you show up and you're like, have you ever done this before? Oh, yeah, yeah, plenty of times. Well, you want him to have that kind of knowledge. He's experiencing this now. Notice again in verse 3 in particular, what Peter says our knowledge is supposed to be of. is to be of Him who called us through His own glory and excellency. What are we learning? We're learning more and more about our Lord, being impressed more and more by our Lord, And we're trying to put that into practice in our own lives. That's the knowledge he's talking about. You know, if I I said to a new Christian, Adonis, sorry, you raised your hand so you're getting used today. If I said to Adonis, Adonis, I want you to be a better Christian. Here you go. Take this, learn it, memorize it, you'll be a better Christian. Well, that's true. But that's pretty daunting too. Because guess what? Josh has been a Christian for many years. I don't have this memorized. I don't understand all of this. But guess what? Here's what Peter does for us. Kind of boils it down. said, you know what? I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version right here. Here's what I want you to learn. Here's what I want you to come to an understanding in your mind. And I want you to begin to put this into practice. Go further in the chapter. For this very reason, Peter says in 2 Peter 1 and beginning in verse 5, For this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Eight things. Now, if you said to me, okay, you can be a better Christian if you can come to a knowledge of, a true knowledge of eight things, that sounds a whole lot better than take this, read it, and do it. Eight things. Beginning with faith, ending with love. Peter says eight things, and then guess what he says about this. If you'll do this, verse 8, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you learn eight things? Can you come to an understanding of eight things? Can you put into practice eight things? Eight virtues, eight qualities of God Himself? Peter says, if you'll focus on these eight things, you won't be unfruitful. You won't be unfruitful in the true knowledge of God. He goes on to say in verse 9, and we'll come back to this passage at a later lesson as well, he who lacks these qualities, okay, you didn't pay attention. You didn't learn and you didn't practice these eight things. Those who lack these qualities is blind, 
or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. We are called to become. We are called to become like our Lord. And our Lord says you can. Starts with a new birth. All of our sins cause us to fall short of the glory of God. No matter how small and insignificant you may think your sins are, they cause you to be less than God. But He holds out the offer to be like Him again. He holds out the promise you can become a partaker of the divine nature again. Be born again. And then grow in your knowledge. Grow in your knowledge of these godly attributes, beginning with faith and ending with love. And guess what? We will know. We will know that we are being like Him. The goal of Christianity, it is not to be a little bit better than I used to be. It is not to be better than the world. The goal of Christianity is nothing less than becoming like God Himself. And we would love nothing more than to aid you in that process, even in taking the first step this morning. If we can do so, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?